Let's hold them high as we get ready to get started. Or in fact, I don't want anybody to be left out. Let's hold them high, right? Right on? I mean, I'm back there in the drum kit and I'm reading along going, oh yeah, and I'm thinking, man, you know, I, I want to be part of the in crowd too. I believe this is the perfected word of God. I believe that in the volume of this book it speaks about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't desire not to live it, and know it through the power of God's Holy Spirit to live it. And that's what it's all about, God's Holy Spirit, amen? Not our desire, not our will, not even our ideas. All solely on the finished work of Christ and the leading of God the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Glad you're here this morning. Acts chapter 22 as we continue through this exciting book. And haven't we had a great time? I mean, this has just been wonderful. The journeys of Paul. We saw Paul. We left Paul last time, if you will. Uh, Paul was bringing the four men into the temple to conclude their vows unto the Lord. And these men were ceremonially purified. These men were ready to go into the temple and pay their, their uh, financials and things, and Paul was going to take care of that. And we saw last time that many of the Jewish men around uh, Jerusalem there they had seen Paul and they made a terrible assumption and really every assumption is terrible. Okay, we need to wait for the facts. We need to relax, but we're so coffeeed up, you know, we're always like bing, bing, bang, boom. And I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. I'm a lot more laid back and I want to get the information and I tell you, there's a lot more times I'm glad that I waited than the times when I opened my mouth. The time I opened my mouth and I ended up getting corrected, I say, you know what, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna do my best not to do that again. But these guys made a terrible assumption. They assumed that Paul brought a Gentile into the temple. And, it, and we saw that that was not true. And so, but that's what created this riot. And so as we left Paul last time, there was a mob that was generated wanting to kill Paul. I mean, what a crazy, crazy time. And so today, we're going to see that Paul will give his witness for Jesus. What a joy. And you know, each and every time Paul gave his witness for Jesus, he found himself in trials and tribulation. Have you been catching that connection? More often than not, and Paul was, I mean, Paul's witness was quick off of his tongue. And every time he started speaking for Jesus, he found himself in a major trial because people just didn't want to hear about the Lord. Well, this morning, we have to inventory our own posture. Are we, do we have a Christian life of trials or do we have a Christian life of ease? And I mean a Christian life of trials. When we speak about Jesus, do people want us to shut up? And hopefully we continue, just like Paul, keep bringing that good news. Even though the trials are many, but yet to, just to live a life of ease and say, well, I'm going to heaven and I'm fine, that's really not God's plan for any of us as born-again believers. None of us. None of us. And so we're going to be able to kind of evaluate today as we go through the book of Acts, chapter 22. And this morning we pick up in verse 1. Paul addressing the mob, Paul speaking, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when the mob had heard that Paul spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And so this Jewish group who was shaking their fists and saying, hey, we're going to kill Paul, all of a sudden they started mellowing out because Paul was speaking as noted here in the beloved Hebrew language. And so it's all of a sudden like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's listen to this guy, hold up, hold up. And that's what's going on in the crowd right now. And so Paul continues in verse 3, I am indeed a Jew. And so that perked up their, their ears again. Wow, he's a Jew? What's up with that? I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, in Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law 
And I was zealous toward God just as you are today. And so, man, all attention at this point is on Paul. He's talking about the law. He's talking about Yahweh. He's talking about the strictness. He's talking about this very infamous man, this Rabbi Gamaliel. I mean, this is exactly what this group wants to hear. Do you notice oftentimes when, when Paul begins an address to people, he brings them in. He brings an audience in. Oftentimes, we've witnessed people actually pushing people away and then throwing the gospel at them as they're running away. That, to me, doesn't seem like a very effective way to do things. I would suggest that we want to try to make friends, and not so much friends, at least just let people feel comfortable around us. Let them feel comfortable around us. We're not freaks. Oh, we're Jesus freaks, certainly. But to an unbelieving world, we've got to let people feel comfortable. Then conversation will develop. But oftentimes, we're trying just to cram our beliefs into people's faces. And I don't know, at least when I try to do that, it doesn't work. I try to make acquaintances and then just let naturally topics of conversation flow naturally, but truly in a supernatural way that nobody sees except for us. And that's much more normal. So Paul is uh, employing that idea. Hey, guys, I'm one of you. I had a guy one time when I was packing up and getting ready to leave U-Turn for Christ. And in my, my uh, panel truck, you know, I brought my drums and everything. And, and I was loading up. And in my, the back of my panel truck, I have a Bible and some other materials. And one of the guys came up to me after we were done with the outreach. And he came up to me and he said the exact words. He said, I see that you're one of us. Because he looked at my truck and he could relate to it. And then he looked in the back window and he saw the Bible laying on the bench seat in the back and he truly, he came genuinely. He says, you know, I, don't, I didn't know who you were or anything, but when I put all these pieces together, and, and again, he was coming up confessing, he says, you're one of us, aren't you? And I thought, perfect. God has touched this guy through the music that we played and through the message that, we, that I gave. And he just said, hey, you're normal. I mean, I can relate to you. You know, you're not some tied down guy that, that I can't relate to. You're one of us. And I thought that was the greatest compliment. And I was just rejoicing in the Lord. But we've got to be normal. We've got to be who we are. And we don't need to change that or pretend that we're something we're not because people will see right through that. And they're not interested in what you're trying to sell them, so to speak. They feel like they're, they're being sold something. People don't want to be sold. They don't want salespeople. That's one of my biggest problems. When I go into a store, and really, i got to mellow out on it, I like to go and browse and develop my own opinion on certain things when I'm looking for something. And I hate having a guy coming up, hey, man, can I help you with this? No, but I appreciate I, I got you, and I, I see you're over there. So when I need you, I'll give you a wave. And those are the guys that they say, okay, great, and stand over there. And that, I like that. But it's not the person. We're buying a T-shirt yesterday in the store, Connie and I. The guy says, hey, you can buy anything else in the store. I'll give you 25% off. I said, no, I'm just here for the T-shirt. Thank you. And so he keeps ringing it up. And he says, hey, by the way, here's a, here's a cup that with your purchase, I'll only charge you a buck and a half. I said, look, I'm here for the T-shirt. And this guy just kept pounding and pounding. And I'm starting to get irritated. My money is hard earned, and I just don't hand it out when someone suggests that I buy something. And I don't care if it was for a buck and a half. It was a great cup, you know, the Rams cup. It looked great. But just probably out of spite, I said, no, I'm not buying it. Hmm. <laughs> I'm paying $35 for this, sh this shirt. And I thought, man, are you kidding me? You got your hand in my pocket already, dude. Back up. <laughs> my goodness, I didn't realize that shirt was $35. bucks. i have said, no way. Where's the $10 rack? That's what I thought I was buying off of. <laughs> My goodness. But Paul was making a coin. He's making people feel comfortable with him. He's got their attention. Hey, I'm a Jew. I, I, I grew up here and I did this and I did the other thing. And people are saying, right on. He's got their attention. He continues on in verse 4. Hey, I even persecuted this way, this Christian way, these, the way of Jesus. I persecuted that group. I persecuted them unto death. I was zealous about this. 
I bound and I delivered to prisons both men and women. I mean, Paul is saying, man, I didn't fool around. Also, the high priest bears me witness. If you don't believe me, you know the high priest. Talk to them. They'll tell you who I was. They'll tell you. And all the council of the elders, they'll, they'll qualify that too. And from them, from the elders, I also received letters to the brethren. And a little better rendering of this. I also received letters from the brethren. And I, with those letters, I went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. So I didn't just police locally here in Jerusalem, fellas. I went outside of the city. I even went as far as Damascus, and I brought prisoners back. These folks that called themselves the way, I brought them back. I'm a, I was a dedicated guy under the law of Moses. And that's what Paul is revealing here. Interestingly, as Peter tells and writes to us in his epistle, 1 Peter 4.12, speaking about our lives as Christians, are you under trials? Well, Peter addresses the first century church, 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, Peter writes, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. No, don't think that odd, but rejoice. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, in other words, when we see Jesus face to face in the soon upcoming appointment that all of us have, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And so that's what brings us back to our, our topic today. Are you living a life of filled with trials because you're a witness for Jesus? Or are you just kind of skating along in your Christian walk? I don't know. I don't really need to know. But I do need to bring that question up. That's why we're in this. And so Peter was saying, hey, if you're in trials, if you find yourself surrounded by these things, don't find it odd. Find it a blessing. Because your witness is for Christ. Jesus saying to his apostles, hey, don't be, don't be surprised if people hate you. Because you know why, fellas, my followers? They hated me before they even knew you. So you're following in my footsteps is what Jesus was saying. And don't find it strange. Find it inviting. Now that's odd with our flesh. We, our flesh wants to be at ease, doesn't it? I, I don't. I mean, I admit, I like I like my lazy boy chair. I admit that. And whoever invented the remote control, man, God bless that guy. Huh? I used to call my brother. I was the oldest of uh, five kids, and I'd call one of my middle or, or even youngest brother, and I'd be laying in the bed, and you know, in my parents' house, and and I'd yell out, I'd say, "Rich, come here, quick." And he'd be like, you know, a little kid, like, he'd run in the bedroom and go, what? And I'd say, oh, never mind. Would you change the channel since you're here to channel four? And after about the third time I, I tried that, didn't work much past that. My other brother had a, my other friend of mine had a stick, a real long stick, six, seven foot stick. He cut a notch in it. And you remember the dials on the old TVs? Well, he took his stick and he would just change, change the dial. We are insane. We love our ease, is my whole point. We like kicking back. We like that. And so this idea of going through trials is a foreign thought to us in the flesh. Our flesh is, what? Where's the remote control? But in our spiritual walk, we got to say, you know what? I'm going to be a witness for Jesus, no matter if it's, a, if it's a welcoming audience, or especially if it's not, I've got to throw some seeds. So where are you involved in this? Are you involved in the VBS? Are you ready to go out to the Harvest Crusade? Are you here on Friday nights helping out? I mean, where are we involved planting seeds? There's a hundred ways of doing it right here under this roof. Wonderful. 
And so as Paul continues in his witness to his audience, he's got all ears and all eyes, and Paul continues in verse 6, now it happened, as he's telling his, his story, it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at noon. Now what's the idea here? The sun is smack in the middle of the sky, high noon, very bright, right? We live here in sun, sunny Southern California. When that sun is in the middle of the sky, man, it's bright. And so Paul is explaining, I was heading to Damascus at noon. And, his, and again, we know his agenda was to take prisoners. So I'm heading to Damascus at noon, at noon, and suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. So he was making a definite distinction. It wasn't the high noon sun. It was something that even outshined the noonday sun. And Paul is saying, in his words here, it was bright. And we're get, we get it through his verbiage. Verse 7, and that light, and when that light shone, I fell to the ground. And then, furthermore, I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It got personal fast, didn't it? It got personal quick. Hey, Saul, I need your attention. And Saul gave that voice the attention, didn't he? And so at this time, not only is Paul on the ground, but his entourage is face down on the ground likewise. The only difference is, is that voice spoke to Saul. And when we hear a voice, we have a tendency, we just turn toward that, don't we? It's natural, it's normal. So as Paul has got his nose in the dirt along with his other buddies, he hears Saul, Saul. And so his reaction is, was to lift his face toward that voice. Now he's looking directly into that, that sun, that, that shining light, if you will. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so reasonably, Saul's answer is, is, um, is, is who are you, Lord? Who are you? Who are you? And the voice returned, and he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. I'm the one whom you're persecuting. You ever have one of those hello moments? Hello, we kid around at the house uh, with one another. If someone does something kind of bonehead, we all kind of turn to one another and say, hello. You know, it's just a, a goofing around, joking around, keeping it lighthearted. But Paul is having one of those hello moments. You're Jesus? I thought you died on the cross. I saw you buried. But yet I've been hearing things that you have ascended. It's true. You're Jesus of Nazareth, just as he introduced himself. At that, mo at that moment, would you give me a little liberty, perhaps? I believe at that moment, Paul, Saul of Tarsus at the time, who we now know as Paul, the apostle, I believe, though, at that moment, hey, I'm Jesus in whom you're persecuting. I believe at that moment, Saul of Tarsus said, I'm yours. Come into my life. We have to believe that that was the case at that particular time. I think it's reasonable, I should say, to offer that as a very important suggestion. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those, verse 9, who were with me, Paul goes on and, and says, Indeed, they saw the light and they were afraid, indicating they kept their heads to the ground. They saw the light and they immediately went to the ground, noses in the dirt, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me, the apostle goes on to say. With that light, the voice came. These guys didn't hear anything. They were scared to death. They were on the ground shaking, rightfully so. But Jesus spoke to me as Paul's recounting and giving his testimony. That voice of Jesus Christ spoke to me directly. Is Jesus speaking to you directly today? He is in one way or another, whether we're, believer, whether we're a believer or not, Jesus is speaking this morning. And in that we find great confidence and we're blessed. We welcome that. They saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. God was speaking Paul's language that he could understand, but only Jesus could speak. I find that interesting. They didn't hear the, the lingo, 
but Paul did. That day you gave your heart to Jesus, he spoke to you in the language that you understand that only he could speak. You know, we present the gospel, we throw the seed, we water, but we don't give the increase. It's the Lord, it's God the Holy Spirit himself that gives that increase. We do the work of a good laborer, though, guided by the Lord. We don't manufacture things. We say, Lord, what would you like to do in this situation? He says, this is what I'd like to do. Well, then great. I'm your guy. Amen? So Paul heard this language, and he understood it. He understood it. The other guys, it didn't affect the other guys at all. In fact, they further drove their faces into the dirt. And so Paul responds in verse 10, What shall I do, Lord? I mean, I got it. I get it. I'm with you. You're the risen Lord, so now what do I do? I've accepted that. What do I do now? So what do I do? And the Lord said to me, Arise and continue in the Damascus. Continue on your road. Keep going. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. This is what I want you to do. Get up and continue on your journey. But interestingly... Verse 11, Paul reports, I could not see my vision. I was blinded. I could not see for the glory of that light. And man, so that, I mean, it's, it was bright. And being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. So Paul is saying here, as, as we reflect, the heavenly light was so bright in verse 7 that at first, that first it overcame the noonday sun. So that's how bright it was. Overcame the noonday day sun. And secondly, it totally overwhelmed Paul and his group. That's how bright this light was. That's how bright it was. Secondly, this light was so bright that as Paul lifted his face toward that voice, this light was so bright that it temporarily blinded the apostle, temporarily. And so at this point, the Lord is saying, continue on to Damascus, but you know what? You're going to have to be led. You big tough guy, Paul, that was going with letters from the elders, was going with chains in hand, was going with the, the paddy wagon to go round up Christians, you're now going to be infirmed and you're now going to have to be walked into Damascus under their care. Wow, that was a wake-up moment for this apostle, for Saul of Tarsus, if you will. He had to humble himself and trust those men that were originally designed to assist him. These assistants now are going to guide Paul into Damascus. Boy, what a humbling place to be. Wow. That's how the Lord meets us, isn't it? He humbles us, and he knows exactly what needs to happen. And so these guys are leading Paul into Damascus, and then finally in verse 12, Paul enters into Damascus, and there's a certain man named Ananias. Of course, a man of God, we'll see here. He was a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. So this is a recognized guy, this Ananias. And, and Paul goes on and says, hey, Ananias came to me. And Ananias stood and said to me, brother Saul, so he's still Saul of Tarsus. Brother Saul, receive your sight. And so this is obvious from the, obviously from the Lord. Now Ananias is getting his walking order. says, hey, you're going to go meet Saul of Tarsus. And can you imagine Ananias immediately saying, Saul of Tarsus, he kills Christians. I mean, that's the first thing out of Ananias' mouth. I mean, again, if we take a little liberty here. Ananias is saying, hey, wait a minute. He kills Christians. And the Lord's saying, Ananias, please. Relax. And Ananias said, okay, you're right. I'm sorry, Lord. You're God. I'm not. That's what Ananias said. Okay, Ananias, now I want you to meet Saul. And then I want you to tell Saul in his infirmed position that he's going to re receive his sight again. And that's for me, Ananias, because you're representing me. And so Paul is going to hear my voice through your mouth. Receive your sight. And Paul goes on to conclude, at that same hour, I looked upon him. In other words, it took some time, but my eyesight eventually came back. Just as the Lord spoke through Ananias. 
Then, Paul continues in verse 14, Ananias continues, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. So Ananias is saying, hey, God has chosen you for a special, special assignment. He's completely changed your life in a matter of days, literally. In fact, maybe even in a matter of hours, Paul's whole mission in life is totally being redirected. And Ananias is saying, you're going to be a witness of his will, and you're going to see the just one. Now, the just one was the title of Jesus Christ. One of the requirements of the first century apostles was that not only were they born again Christians, but they had in their background, they were taught, they had seen, and were taught by Jesus Christ. In the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, Paul refers, and when we get there, as the Lord tarries, we'll look at it a little closer, but Paul was referring that the Lord took me away for a good three years, and Jesus taught me. He revealed himself to me. When you get a chance tonight, look at Galatians chapter 1, and we'll see that that's what Paul was identifying. See, I, I, I saw the just one. I saw Jesus, and I sat at his feet, and I was taught by his mouth. And then we'll see later on in the, the New Testament writings that Paul was saying, I am an apostle by the authority of God the Father through Jesus Christ. And so this is, again, we don't have all the details, but we get the picture here. So Paul is giving his accounting to his audience. And they're still listening. They're all eyes and all ears. And so Ananias continues as Paul is re reviewing his story, his testimony. In verse 15, For you, Paul, will be the Lord's witness to all men of what you have seen and what you have heard. And then Ananias takes a dramatic break and then says, Paul, why are you waiting? Waiting for what? Arise, Paul, be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now again, I have to make a suggestion that when Paul was on the ground and then he responded to the voice of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I believe that was the time that Paul's conversion was completed. That's my belief. And then Ananias is saying, hey, you're a public guy, Saul of Tarsus, so you know what you're going to do now? We're going to go down and have you publicly baptized. Because you need to show people the outward demonstration of what has happened inwardly. Inwardly. When we have our annual baptism, we don't do it in order for people to be saved before, I mean, we teach this before we even get to our location, our baptism location, and then before we dunk the people, we ask them once again, you need to confirm, are you a born again Christian? And they say, yes, I am. And then we re remind them, say, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to make a public declaration that you've already accepted Jesus Christ and he's washed away your sins. But now you're gonna do it physically for a testimony. Your family here, your church family, some of your friends that you've invited, you're giving them a witness by saying, God has changed my heart and I want to demonstrate, I want to show that to you by my baptism, my public baptism. And so that's what Ananias is saying here. Hey, let's go publicly have you baptized so other people can see. They can see what's going on. And so Paul naturally agreed to that. And in verse 17, now it happened, Paul continues, when I returned to Jerusalem. And so this is the, the thought that after three years, and maybe some more time, but after the three years of sitting at the feet of Jesus in Arabia, Paul is saying here in verse 17, I then returned. After that period of time, I then returned, and it happened when I returned to, to Jerusalem. I was praying in the temple. And I went into a trance. We saw Peter going into a trance and, and speaking, uh, the Lord Jesus speaking to Peter. And now we, we see Paul uh, revealing that. Likewise, I was in a trance and I saw Jesus saying to me, Paul speaking, make haste. So the Lord recorded to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. And so Paul said, so I responded. I said, Lord, 
They know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. My reputation as a terrorist is solid, Paul was saying. As I was Saul of Tarsus, my reputation was well known. Verse 20, and when the blood of your martyr, Lord, your martyr Stephen, when your martyr Stephen was blood was shed, I also was standing by, standing by consenting to his death, and I guarded the clothes of those who were killing him. Interesting, again, when we kind of let our mind wander for a moment, the Apostle Paul, prior to him being the Apostle Paul, as duly noted several times, Paul killed and imprisoned a lot of people. What was the result of that? Families were split right down the middle. Fathers were yanked right out of their homes in front of their children in chains. Probably as they were being beaten and drug out. Can you imagine the children just crying and screaming for mercy? Not our daddy. And Paul just mercilessly ripped these fathers out of their homes. And in the minute mom would stand up and say, you can't take my husband, she was knocked down and drug out likewise. Thrown into the paddy wagon, if you will, waiting outside of the home. Families were absolutely ripped apart. Now, although Paul, of course, was forgiven for that, but he could never forget the things that he had done. Can you imagine as... The, as the Apostle Paul would wander around and he would see perhaps the parents of Stephen. And maybe mom would be walking along and mom's, mom would look up the, the mother of Stephen and see, see the Apostle Paul and she'd look at him and stare at him and then say, oh no, I've got to look away. And that moment where Paul was guarding the clothing of those that stoned Stephen, it just went right back into his mind. It was like it was happening right there. It's just a normal reaction. It's the way our brains work. But can you imagine the many, many times that Paul was reminded that, man, I killed that guy's father. I separated that family and, and burned their house down. And he was seeing throughout his ministry the, rem the remnants of those survivors. Could you imagine his heart was just breaking? It had to be. And he wanted to go and minister. But what, how, what do you do? Do you say, I'm sorry? You know, as the person, you, 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 you go up to someone and break their arm, and, and then they get it set and everything, and it starts to heal. What do you do? You go up and you say you're sorry, and the person with the broken arm says, I still got a broken arm. You might be sorry, but you're not as sorry as I am. And so can you imagine, I can only imagine Paul having to deal with, on a daily basis, the reminders of his terrorism. But yet the Lord received him and used him in a mighty way, as we know. And so we have got to learn from this. I mean, we have to pray for each and every individual that's breathing on this earth. It's not an easy thing. It's not natural, I'll tell you that. It's certainly a supernatural activity. We don't want to pray for the, the moms that send their bomb-laden children into a group of innocent people on a sidewalk. We don't want to pray that way, but we must. Because bottom line, if that person, if that mom who sent their child into that, into that group, bomb-laden, but if that mom turns her heart to Jesus, guess what? We're going to see her in heaven. And that's a difficult thing for the, the, the fleshly mind to deal with. It's hard. But we've got to deal with it. And this is what Paul had to go through, I would suggest, on a regular basis. He saw the remnants of his terrorism. And I have to suggest it ripped him up every single time. Horrible thing. Let's be very careful how we conduct ourselves in our lives. Verse 19, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. 
and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Verse 21, then Paul, remember he's speaking to the mob. Paul says, the Lord said to me, Paul, depart for I will send you far from here to go to the Gentiles. Now, let's re be reminded, everything was fine up to this point. But the minute Paul said the Gentiles, the place erupted. Verse 22, up to this point, the mob listened to Paul until this word Gentiles, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. So they started flipping out again. Gentiles, hey, wait a minute, we're God's chosen. God's got nothing to do with the Gentiles, nothing further from the truth. God chose the Jewish nation to bring the good news of salvation, but the Jews misinterpreted their choosing, and they said, hey, we're it, you're not. So too bad for you type idea. And so when just the idea that God would save a Gentile, that was too much for this crowd. They lost their minds once again. Verse 23, then as they cried out, they tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air. And now the commander ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks and that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted against him. And so the commander, again, he's very confused. He doesn't know who this guy Paul is. And he's saying, I've got to get to the bottom of this. So he got his garrison, his officers, to bring Paul into the barracks. And then they were going to examine him, which is defined they were going to beat him. They were going to torture him, basically, until Paul finally said, this is who I am. Well, Paul's already said who he was. But yet the commander is saying, why is the crowd just losing it? I don't get this idea, Jew, Gentile, this sort of thing. I'm, I'm totally ignorant in verse 25. So they bound Paul with, with thongs. And then Paul said to the centurion who stood by, and Paul asked the centurion, the Roman guard, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and even additionally uncondemned? There were certain laws and privileges for Roman citizens. And Paul is saying, hey, is this legal, me as a Roman citizen, to be bound? And the centurion thought, wait a minute. What's going on here? And in verse 26, when the centurion heard, heard that, he went and told his commander, saying, hey, take care of what you do, for this man is a Roman. You didn't bother to ask, but he is fessed up. He's a Roman. Now, the commander knew exactly what was going on. A Roman? Oh, my goodness. So the commander, in verse 27, came and said to, said to Paul and asked Paul, Tell me, are you a Roman? That's what I'm hearing. And Paul responds, Yes, I'm a Roman. And the commander answered, Well, with a large sum of money, I obtained my citizenship. And Paul responded in like. He said, I was born a citizen. Wow. And now the commander is just starting to think, who is this guy? What is going on? And so immediately, rightfully so, verse 29, those who were about to examine him, in other words, lay the rod on his back, they withdrew from him. They knew what was going on. Oh my goodness, we didn't realize this was a Roman citizen. So they withdrew from Paul immediately, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that Paul was a Roman. And he was afraid, secondly, because he had Paul bound up. And he shouldn't have done that. And so the commander, rightfully so, was scared. That brought some attention to this situation. The next day, because the commander wanted to know for certain why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So again, the commander has no clue to what's going on. So the next day, he wanted to know. He released Paul from his bonds and commanded the chief priests, in other words, the, the Jewish elders, he commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear, and then he was preparing and going to bring Paul down and set him before the religious leaders. Never a dull moment in Paul's life, amen? <laughs> Exciting stuff. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. The apostle Paul was giving his testimony to this Jewish crowd. God has given each and every Christian a testimony. All of us. Don't ever walk around and say, I don't have a testimony. You do have a testimony. I don't know what it is, perhaps, but all Christians have a testimony. Be quick to share your testimony as the Lord leads. Be quick as the Lord leads. 
Paul's address to the Jewish crowd went fine up until the word Gentile was introduced. The thought of the Gentile world being saved or having a relationship with Yahweh was much too much for the Jewish mind to handle. It was too much. And just like Jesus, Paul needed to be silenced. And that was the response of the Jewish crowd. Paul's got to be silenced. We'll hear no more of this Jesus of Nazareth. Shut him down. As Jesus has been speaking today, the question that needs to be answered, are you receiving the voice of Jesus? When Saul heard that voice, he responded by looking up. And so he received, Paul received, and we have to ask, are we receiving or are we silencing? As we're going to gather this morning for communion, This is a time for Christians as we come in literally heart to heart with Jesus himself. And Jesus and the elements are partaken with, with those that he loves. It's not for the non-believer. So if you're a non-believer here this morning, please, if the communion tray comes by, just gracefully just pass it along. We'd appreciate that. It's mostly for your benefit. It doesn't affect us in any kind of way, but it's important. It's, it's just incumbent on me to, to reveal Scripture. If you're, if you're not a born-again believer, just pass the bread and the cup, no problem. But if you'd like to receive Jesus simply from your seat, you can just say, Lord, I've heard your word this morning. And as Paul responded, Jesus, I want to respond likewise to your voice. I want to quit persecuting you. I want to quit persecuting myself. And I want to receive you, Jesus, as I turn from my sin. And if you simply do that from your, your chair, we would invite you to join in in the communion bread and the cup. We would desire that. And so as the guys hand out the elements... George will lead us in a worship song. Take the time just to reflect. Take the time to talk to the Lord this morning. And then after all the elements are passed out, we will join together and take the elements together under the glory of God. Amen. We thank you that we can sing about that amazing love. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave us that measure of faith to receive the grace that only you can offer. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for our acceptance. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for living within us, guiding us, allowing your fruit to be developed and revealed in our lives. Amazing things have happened, Lord, ever since we came to you. And we pray that this is only the beginning, whether we've been walking with you for five months, five years, 35 years, Lord, we would pray that you just pour out fresh wind and fresh fire in our lives. Burn out the old man, Lord God. Allow us to turn our head toward that voice from heaven, identifying yourself as Jesus of Nazareth, Allow us to follow that voice and to bask in that overwhelming brightness of your light, your holiness. Let us walk in it. For your glory, Lord, and truly for our benefit, we pray these things. And we celebrate our union with you, Jesus, through these elements this morning, the bread and the cup. As you direct us, you tell us, take this bread and this cup, partake, and do this in remembrance of me. Thank you for this memorial, Lord. We join together as a body of Christ in celebrating the communion table, your goodness. And it is in your name we pray these things. Amen. Let's partake.
Praise the Lord. All this in heaven too, huh? Doesn't get much better than this. Praise the Lord. Join me by standing as we bless, and then directly after, George will lead us in a final worship song. Get acquainted with the activities out in the lobby. Get acquainted with the coffee ministry. And continue to draw close to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that he reveals himself in a mighty new, fresh way to you this week. And that you know that you know that he speaks to you in that language that you understand that only he can speak. Be guided by his goodness. Amen. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday. Psalms. Let's shout to the Lord.